I'm Nick Pachuda, and we're going to have a session today on uh, the light at the end of the tunnel in medtech investing. There is light at the end of the tunnel, we promise. Um, so we, we put together an amazing panel of highly experienced both investors and operators to give a you know, diverse set of insights and also some practical knowledge that you can take away. Um, so I'm Nick Pachuda. I was a surgeon for 10 years, 20 plus years in industry. I've had three successful exits. Uh, worked at 10 years at Johnson & Johnson, uh, leading external innovation in med tech. Um, in the last four years, um, I've been a general partner at Mountain State Capital. We're going on to our second fund, a $100 million seed stage fund. And opera I'm an operator at a clinical stage biotech called Peptologics, creating new antibiotics for medical device infection. Um, let me turn it over. We'll just go down the line for some quick introductions. Hi, everybody. Sean Morris um, with Cultivation Capital. I also run a company called Amplify Vascular. I'm based in St. Louis, Missouri. Started my career holding the bag, selling medical devices to image-guided uh, uh, physicians doing uh, treatment under x-ray guidance, um, whether it's vascular surgeons, IRs, cardiologists. Um, made my way through the chain, uh, ended up operating uh, a division at Angio Dynamics. Uh, then I started a company building a venous stent. Boston Scientific acquired that, um, did a stroke uh, company. Uh, so I have an uh, operational side, and then uh, on the investor side with Cultivation Capital, again, a uh, uh, it's fun for life science focusing on vascular medical devices. So it's a pleasure to be here. Look forward to, uh, to this panel. Hi, folks. My name's Iman Namati. I'm the CEO of SpectraWave, a intravascular imaging company based out of Boston. Uh, my background is in medical imaging. I did a PhD in X-ray CT for pulmonary applications. Um, and then jumped into a uh, startup, so I switched from academia to industry uh, to help lead the technical division of a uh, startup that was being founded in, in Boston for oncology space uh, using optical imaging technologies. And then about four and a half years ago, joined SpectraWave to take it from concept to commercialization, uh, which we kicked off about six months ago. Uh, and then happy to say that I just closed uh, with our incredible team a $50 million Series B financing. Uh, led actually by J&J. Mm -hmm. um, so that, great to be here. Thank you. Solid. Mm -hmm. Great. Good afternoon. Anita Watkins. I'm the managing director of Rex Health Ventures. <coughs> I'm the non-operator up here, but get to operate a fund that serves as the corporate arm for UNC Healthcare. We're a 12-year-old fund. We invest all across the healthcare spectrum and um, certainly have seen the, the rough times and the good times and look forward to talking about the good times. Hey guys, uh, Omid Akhavan, I lead Anthro Ventures. Uh, we're a family office based out of DC, uh, mostly do clinical through commercial stage med tech. My background, bioengineer by training, early career in clinical research, and then management consulting, strategy business development uh, for Beckton Dickinson, and then moved into investing about eight, nine years ago. Great. So obviously, you know, fantastic panel with a ton of investment and operational experience. Um, so with that, with that, let's kick it off. And just start with uh, something maybe not so simple is the current macro environment, right? And uh, Amit, I'll start with you. Um, you know, given the current macro, you know, what are your thoughts on the current situation? And then what kind of deals are getting done? What kind of risk are people actually taking right now? Yeah, so, I, you know, what I've seen over the last year, I think we had a panel back in uh, Dana Point. We we're talking about the challenges in med tech um, and the harsh realities. And I think this last year has been pretty hard uh, for early stage med tech. Um, the macro environment is a little bit confusing. The market's very volatile. You know, we hit new highs, then the market's dropped, the election's coming. So I think people are wary to deploy capital. Um, and a lot of folks are just holding cash, um, you know, collecting their 5% on T-bills uh, and waiting to see what happens in the market. But we are still seeing deals get done, right? You know, Iman, perfect example. There are a bunch of other LSI alumni. Um, and so I think the market is opening back up. You know, investors, I would say, over the last two years have been very cautious. But they all raised funds in 2020, 2021, 2022. Ultimately, they have to deploy that capital on behalf of their LPs. And so I'm seeing the checkbooks really opening up. So I'd add to that, we're about to close on three deals, um, and we didn't do a net new deal last year. Um, so that's a big change. We certainly did follow-ons. 
But I think one of the things that we're hearing from co-investors, especially we play a big role in helping pull a syndicate together for companies, especially when we have a lot of conviction around that. We have clinical buy-in. One of the things I'm hearing from funds is they are so heavy on um, overvalued companies that still haven't hit their valuation or inflection points. They, they want as safe a deal as possible to round out their portfolio. So they're looking for really investor-friendly terms. They're looking for commercial stage. And so one of the ways that I'm seeing deals get done is those, the terms are really changing. Um, I look at the three we're about to close. Um, there's liquidation preferences. There's warrants. There's big drops in valuations. And so I think that's the, the key market indicator right now is to get a deal done, you've got to be willing to, to look at I, I don't like the flat as the new up, um, but in a lot of ways, it is something that's got to be considered to get, keep the company going. Yeah, we found we found that to be the case as well. It definitely has warmed up in the last probably six months. Mm -hmm. um, I would say when we first kicked off our Series B fundraise about twelve plus months ago, uh, it was it was a really tough tough period. And uh, I think yeah, you have to give give some concessions, uh, like like you said, Anita. And um, but ultimately, I think the you know, getting the right syndication is, is key. And mm -hmm. as long as you can get the right people to the table, uh, then, then I think you can have a good, good path forward, uh, even if you have to have some concessions on valuation. Iman, what was the, the trigger that went from trying to raise capital, capital to actually being able to get it across the finish line? Yeah, I think, you know, it's interesting. The, the process itself was not a typical as far as meeting with uh, really good quality investors and, and sharing the vision. I think one of the things that, you know, for us, we were, we had just transitioned into a commercial entity. Um, and so we, you know, there was a certain amount of de-risking, of course, that had happened with the business. And now the question is, are we going to get traction in the market? Mm -hmm. And, you know, we, one of the things I, w I would just say just generally to anyone out there raising money is don't take your eye off the business itself, the core business. Um, need to keep pushing that forward. And ultimately, at every stage, uh, as we brought in new, in new investors to the table, it was the, it was the positivity around how well the business was doing mm -hmm. that, that drove, you know, drove them into, into the investment round itself. Um, but for us, I think ultimately, just to pull it all together, it was having a strategic lead, the financing, uh, which I think a lot of the venture groups, although they were quite excited about what we were doing, it, it brought us another level of validation to the company today and also its uh, future uh, for valuation. I just had a question for, for Anita and Amid. You, you brought up um, creative terms and, 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 and um, you know, being strategic about you know, what you see with preference and warrants. And are you, are you sort of uh, looking for that as a, as a fund? Or are you having CEOs come in and be uh, proactive and saying, uh, "Hey, this is what we're looking to do," or, or you know, just try to just try, try to reach the finish line. Or is that more from from your side? So actually, it's a little bit of both. One of the deals, it's an eighty million dollar deal, will close in the next couple of weeks. It was the CEO driven and saying, "You know, I've got all this interest. No one's going to get across the finish line." They all keep coming back and saying, "It's valuation." Let's tack on a preference. Let's tack on some warrants um, to incentivize and. I think we filled out the syndicate in about four weeks after that. So I think sometimes if you're a CEO, you're you're reluctant to do that because you feel weak, or maybe your board isn't aligned that way. And to go to an investor to say, what else can we do to make it more attractive? Um, you know, you always take pride in wanting to you know fund your company, or maybe not use a placement agent to help you fund the company, uh, or go, or to go to your board to say, you know, because you feel maybe it's it's a point of weakness, but. You're really just trying to be creative and make it a win-win situation. So I was just really curious. I mean, what do you think about how people, if they come to you to say that? I know you're creative anyways, but. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, so I think it's, it's about, so it's always a balancing act as an investor because you need, you obviously want the best deal, but you want management to also be incentivized and properly incentivized. And so as an investor, your job is to balance you know, ensuring that whoever's sticking around with the company. So let's say there are some legacy co-founders that have left and gone on to do other things. You're a lot less worried about their interests than you are, you know, the management team. And so um, I would say one, it's about ownership, 
right? And kind of where the company is in the cycle. And as an investor, you generally want to maximize ownership for the least amount of dollars. And so depending on where you are in the life cycle, obviously if, if it's all been great and you're continuing to progress and you had great clinical data and you're moving to commercialization, you'll have an easier time raising. If you, you, know, you had trouble and you have to now re-engineer your device, um, you're in a different position. And so I think as an investor, it's about um, managing risk. And the risk is, A, is your management going to stick around after you make this investment and actually drive? So if they own, if they go from owning, owning 15% to owning 2%, which I have going on in one of my portfolio companies, um, it's how do you defend their interests so that they stick around and are motivated? Um, and then in terms of just optimizing for you know, risk-adjusted return, sometimes you have to add a liquidation preference. I mean, there's always you know, standard terms or 1x liquidation preference. Investors get their money back if you sell for a very low value, but generally that goes away once you clear the hurdle of dollars invested. But what, uh, and for the audience, participation means that you not only get that your money back, but you also get your percentage ownership in the company after that from the proceeds. So you kind of get one more turn or two more turns or three more turns on your money. Um, and I know that was, they were very common kind of post financial crisis 2008 kind of started to go away in 2015. And I think, you know, liquidation participation features are coming back um, just because investors have to manage downside risk um, and optimize for return. Yeah, I don't think anybody's going through sort of the standard process anymore. You've got sort of different types of investors leaning in. Um, you've got uh, everybody I've talked to this week, we're doing a note and then we'll do our priced round when you know, <laughs> the terms get a little bit better. Um, there's folks taking, you know, venture debt, et cetera. Uh, I wanted to maybe touch on the topic of <clears throat> the different types of investors. And given this macro, um, you know, we know there's high net worths and family offices, early venture growth capital, private equity, strategics. Who's leaning in right now and who's sort of leaning out? And I'll just turn over whoever wants to jump in on that one. Hmm. Good. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I, I think they all are. Uh, it's, it's a, it's a very... Wild, wild west sort of a thing. Um, and I think as a CEO, as I am one, um, you have to just get, put yourself out there and talk to everybody. I mean, some people might uh, say, well, if I have a strategic on board, then it caps my upside. I've, I've had personal success with bringing a strategic into my cap table with, with, uh, with Venity, the Venus Stent. I had both Phillips or Volcano that got acquired by, by Phillips and then Boston Scientific. At the end of the day, there was like a hot minute of competition, uh, which is really exciting. Boston Scientific was the, was the entity that took us out, uh, and it was a good return for investors. So I think it's a sort of level of comfort. It sort of paves the way for, uh, um, you know, who, who might acquire you. And there's, of course, dangers there if, you're, if they say, well, we don't like you anymore. And then, they're, then everybody's wondering why, why you smell like a dead fish, you know. So, um, so I think uh, strategic uh, uh, investments, uh, very interesting, and, and more and more of these corporates, I think, are, are doing their own venture funds mm -hmm. and, and looking at either white space opportunities or uh, investing in areas where they want to, to look into and, and eventually build portfolio strategy around. Um, but I also see, and I'll be quiet after this, but I also see um, family offices really coming in to play a lot more because they're getting more organized and more structured. They, they, they run a better diligence process. Uh, and they're, they're really interesting to work with because they're sort of all over the board uh, and they're looking to make an impact. A lot of them, a lot of them are. So I, I just see a lot more and, and pro perhaps the audience has seen a lot more um, third parties that are trying to bring in these offices together, you know, through AI platforms or what have you to make introductions to these offices that are always looking for deal flow. Yeah, I would, I would echo that. I mean, we, through our process, we took on pretty significant amount of convertible note dollars um, and then culminated in the final Series B. And that came from uh, very much individuals, uh, family offices, um, you know, employees, uh, and then existing investors, uh, users in, in some cases. Um, and then ultimately it was a very, um, you know, very kind of typical, I would say, VC round, although it was led by a strategic um, and included, you know, uh, uh, blue chip uh, venture groups um, in the final series B. But, you know, to the extent that you can speak to every single person that will listen to your story, um, even if it doesn't lead to, to any dollars today, you never know in 12 months, 24 months, uh, 48 months, uh, you, you know, those relationships will, will come back in a mm -hmm. positive way. 
I definitely feel like the, the it is a lean in moment. Um, I I feel like um, everybody's looking. Um, I compared to 2022 and 20 early 23, where I had investors saying, "Look, we're just pencils down mm-hmm. right now." Mm-hmm. Especially some of the <laughs> funds like mine, other health system funds, and there's you know there's like 30 something of us now. So this is as a sector we've we've grown quite a bit over the last. 10 years or so, but there was a lot of concern with balance sheets and and folks were just penciled down. And I'm not seeing that now. I feel like it is definitely a lean in moment and people are looking for the deals as your first point. There's a lot of money that needs to be put to work and uh, they're just looking for the right terms. Yeah, I've certainly seen, you know, strategics that either they have internal strategic venture that they're certainly deploying that capital because they have a different, you know, risk tolerance and they see the valuations where they are, they want to be able to lock in companies that they're looking to acquire or commercialize down the road. I've also seen strategies that didn't traditionally have venture create a pathway mm-hmm. to do that. And that's been really interesting to me, especially in the last six months. Mm-hmm. And there's definitely a difference in the market mm-hmm. from Dana Point in the spring till now. I've seen it. You can feel it. You can see the deals being announced. A lot of strategic activity. And you're right. A lot of people sort of teeing up how they're going to deploy that capital and make just when the, the inflection point uh, is coming. And we'll talk about the, you know, the next six months here in a minute. Um, obviously, when we talk about who's able to raise capital easier than others, uh, when we talk about CEOs, right, there's serial entrepreneurs, which are obviously less risky to invest in. And then there's first time CEOs. There's a lot of first time CEOs here. Um, if we were, you know, we need to give less advice maybe to people that have done it two or three times and had exits. For the first time, CEOs, especially when you're thinking about investor readiness, because every CEO here is trying to raise money for the most part, maybe what are some thoughts we could impart to first time CEOs about sort of being investor ready? Mm. Come on. May I, I'll, I'll jump in. Um, so I think in any investor process, you know, you you need to convince them that the problem you're solving is important and that you have a solution that has a potential, you know, to generate a return to serve the market. Um, Anything that you can do to reduce friction in that process. So have your data room ready, have your budget ready, have your financial projections ready, have different scenarios ready, Um, have reference calls, right? I, I, I did diligence on a deal and I called, you know, three of the company provided KOLs one of them was like, yeah, you know, it's interesting, but like, I wouldn't use it, right? So like, just, just make sure that your references are, you know, solid. Um, obviously, you know, every investor takes th- those conversations with a grain of salt, but you want, you want to hear the KOLs are jazzed up about what you're doing. They're excited about it. They feel it's transformative. And if it's not, you know, that's instantly you lost an investor. Um, so I think those are some things, but I, I don't know yeah. if you have other... So uh, a couple of things I would add, surround yourself with board members who've been there, done that, you know, independent board members um, who can make those introductions. Also consider, especially if you're early stage, a fractional CFO that's raised money 10, 15 times. Um, they've done the roadshow. They know, they know what they're doing. Um, and then just be careful with your terms in the market. Make sure you've tried your pitch out on a lot of people. Um, you can usually spot a first-time CEO if if they're using you know buzzwords um, like right now. If I AI <laughs> chat, <laughs> well, I, it's, it's more around the investment itself. If I hear one more person pitch to me, just for you, potential customer, we're going to open up um, our Series A from two years ago. It's same terms. <laughs> Um, and it, you know, it means they actually aren't able to generate the revenue they need. Um, so just be honest with what's going on with your company. We're having trouble with customer traction. We could really use a corporate, especially a health system fund to help us understand that sales strategy. Really know who the investor is and, and don't try and sugarcoat what's going on within the company. I think that's so important. Ultimately, people are investing in you and your leadership team. So I think just being genuine and having high integrity and and being honest about where you are today, ideally you have some good kind of track record, whether it's being a serial entrepreneur or even within the kind of the ecosystem of that one startup. Okay, we said we were going to do this three years ago. We did it. 
we said we were going to do this two years ago. We did it. We had some issues. We resolved them. I think that that builds a lot of confidence and just be very genuine. Um, and, you know, I think people that resonates very strongly with with uh, investors. I'll just add everybody was a first time CEO once. Uh, I didn't know what a cap table was or what preferred equity was when I started my company. And it was in 2009 in St. Louis. Everybody was complaining about having a board meeting in St. Louis where there's cows. <laughs> and, and I, you know, all I knew was that I had to figure it out and I had a good idea. And, you know, I, I ended up uh, working with the guy at Baird Venture Partners who I'd never had heard of before. And I dragged him to, um, you know, overnight flight to Germany to close in a half a million dollars from an orthopedic uh, doctor. Um, and, you know, that was a part of my syndication and, and getting, getting him going. Um, and then everybody touched on it. You kind of learn just to be really honest because you, you don't want to lose credibility. Um, it's, these are really, really hard things to do to run a company. So everybody knows it. And, the, and if you can identify what your, um, you know, what your headwinds are and you have some ideas on how to address it, that's obviously, you know, a, a really needed thing. And then people, I mean, people make the difference all around. So align yourself with really good people um, that'll go to battle with you um, and, you know, incentivize them and you're off to the races. Yeah, speaking of the races, right? When I when I think about investment, you can either invest in the jockey or the horse, right? You've got to have a good jockey first. Well, then you segue. get then to, then you'll get to the horse, right? But to me, I'm looking for a CEO that's got passion, conviction, and they're coachable. They will listen and they know their blind spots or they're willing to hear what their blind spots are and then address them, mm -hmm. right? That is so critical. You know, you hear so many pitches of I've got it covered. I have a slide on that. It's in my appendix. I've, I, I have every, every answer. There's no chance you have every answer, right? And if you're a first-time CEO, pressure test your story, board members, independent folks, um, and, and find out what those blind spots are early and address them, and you're not going to be perfect. It's okay to learn and evolve. Now, it brings up a sticky situation, which I've been seeing lately, is um, sticking to your story versus pivoting based on the feedback you've heard. And, and given times where it's hard to raise money, I see a lot of people pivoting their story. Mm. It was this indication six months ago, but now we're over here, mm. right? Well, what are your thoughts about, you know, sort of perseverance and sticking to the story versus taking that input and maybe, you know, when it's the right time to pivot your, your company? Because you, you see companies that fail because of lack of the pivot at the right time. Um, you know, what's your thoughts? And given the macro right now and how, how hard it is to raise money, um, what's the importance of sticking to the story versus pivoting based on what a few investors might have told you? I think it depends why you're pivoting. Yeah. If it's because of a buzzword or, you know, a, something that's kind of percolating in the community and you think, okay, I'm going to get the money if I, if I say I have AI or crypto or something, you know, silly like that. Um, versus you really understand your business. You've learned something unique by putting it into practice. And you've decided, you know what, this is actually a better use case or a better business proposition um, and, and you can explain that if, I think if you can explain it in, in the context of the pitch, it's fantastic. I think people want to see that you're, yeah. that you're learning, that you're open, that you're not, this is not a move forward type situation that under all costs, you're just going to kind of plow forward, even though, you know, it's not quite the right direction. I a hundred percent agree. If it's clinically valid, especially if there's reimbursement, um, tell the story around, we started in this indication there's no room in that DRG. Um, so we're pivoting to this indication um, to, uh, otherwise you're not gonna be able to sell. I think as long as you're able to tell the story, um, what I don't wanna see are five pivots, you know, over the course of a couple right. of years. Um, that's, I, we've seen that recently. Um, and I do think that that speaks to inexperience, mm -hmm. um, but it is important to really understand your indication and not say, you know, if you have a, a chief medical officer, it's, it's like, no, we're staying in this space. I know it. I know it. Trust me, the physicians do not understand the business side of this <laughs> world. Um, at least I'm sure there's some that do, um, but certainly the ones that are practicing do not. And so um, listen to the business side. If there's not reimbursement, if there's not a pathway to actually sell your device, you need to look elsewhere. Yep. So, you know, there's I always think about, you know, the startup world having to have a three, you know, it's a three-legged stool, right? A big clinical problem, a technical solution that's differentiated and amazing, and then 
uh, a business side, the ability to be investable, to commercialize and be able to exit and to balance those three. And to, if you balance them early, you don't go too far clinical. You don't go too far technical. You make sure that you've thought about the business considerations early. And I always say it's never too early to talk to strategics. It's never too early to think about reimbursement. That's come up a few times. Um, so, you know, I want to go back to a point that Anita, you made earlier about, you know, for first time CEOs and, and pitching, you know, the role of the chair, the role of the executive chair, and let's, let's be really practical about it. You know, when you're making a you know, your first time pitch to investor X, um, what is that role of the CEO versus um, a board member, chair, executive chair? I'll start with you. You brought it up. No, Anita. You you. Anita, yeah. So, um, I, one, the CEO needs to do the pitch, um, first and foremost. Um, that's, you've got to believe that the CEO um, knows what they're doing. Really, it's the, the board member and others um, that have expertise are there to make the introductions, to make that soft handoff. Off. I mean, this is, this is a social practice. Um, it is who you know and who you can get in, in front of. And so utilize them for that soft handoff. But first and foremost, the CEO's got to be the one that knows it and can do the pitch. And, and I think going back to your point earlier about know what you don't know. Um, a company pitched recently, CEO, they're in the last first time CEO, they're in the final stages of negotiating a term sheet, ready to sign a couple of days. I said, so when do you think you'll close? They said, oh, four weeks. <laughs> You won't even have deal docs done in four weeks. Let alone. Right. So, and just know know what you don't know, um, and then and just say, you know what? I, I'm hoping to close as soon as possible. I recognize we've got um, quite a few things we've got to get in place, but I think that just it's uh, it's going it, to it's going to give us a lot more confidence that you're not just puffing um, your way through this. How do you how do you perceive? Um, when a board member gives most of the presentation versus the CEO, what's the immediate implication of that? You're going to have a new CEO. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Right. So, yeah, be careful. They can be useful, but um, you want to you make sure the CEO can carry the story, right? Uh, anybody else want to comment on the, the role of board members? I think um, just, just to add, um, being, being able to find at least one, one of them that's, uh, that you can be vulnerable with, but not, they're not going to judge it, right? So you have to be able to go and say, hey, I have this issue. Like I have a dashboard that I try to use on my board meeting where I say, here's what's going good, here's what's not going great, and here's what uh, keep, keep me up at night, right? You have to have credibility. You have to be able to, to, be able to discuss with your board member or members about, about things that are, uh, you know, keeping you awake at night. And make sure they don't, they're not judging you based on the fact that you're asking questions or asking for support. Mm -hmm. and, and that's also, uh, you know, extended in, into the community as well. Yeah, that's one of the things I, I tell CEOs is there's conversations that you can have with board members, some you know better than others. There's conversations that you can have with your leadership team. And then there's conversations you don't want to have with either one, right? Mm -hmm. So maybe find, find yourself some advisors that are independent, have no financial interest in your company, and just honestly want to give you good feedback. Um, so you can have those tricky conversations, especially at really pivotal times in the company, to make sure you're, you're not talking to people that have different incentives than yourself. Um, and I think it's really important to get independent feedback. Um, so let's go back to partly what, what board members can sometimes do for you is, is access, right? Because the relationships that the board has are typically broader than many of the CEOs. Um, there's warm introductions and then there's cold calls. And we talked about this as we were prepping is if you get that email from someone, maybe you know, maybe you don't, but you've got, you know, a long email um, with a lot of items in it and an attachment with a teaser or a non-con deck, and you get that um, versus three sentences from someone you know. To just give the perception. I want to hear from everybody. The perception of the cold call email with the, the teaser versus three sentences from somebody you know, what the impact of those are. We just go right down the line. Huge, hu huge impact, uh, you know, have, having that warm handoff as opposed to coming out of the blue. Um, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these independent board members, we'll talk about them because they don't have the, the conflict. They're really brought in for that reason, I think, and, mm -hmm. and to be the mentor and to be the, the safe repository of your concerns to, uh, and, and, and also to work the board and, and, and so, you know, soft sell some of the ideas and concepts you might have. Mm -hmm. 
I forgot the question. No. I'm, I'm just going off on a tangent. Yeah, the, the difference of warm intros versus oh, yeah, yeah, cold yeah. call email, and then and then that part too. Yeah, and make warm intros, no, please. Yeah, I think I think it's, I think it's night and day difference, and ultimately you just want to get in front of someone to give them your kind of your short pitch, mm-hmm. and you don't. I don't even think you want to send them a teaser. Honestly, there's too many nuances there. You you want to get in front of them. You want them to meet you. You want them to you know get a kind of a re- resonate with a, a relationship there. Um, there's no question getting a warm introduction. I'll tell you, for for us, one of the things that we did was we we listed out all the different venture groups that we wanted to get in front of, and we sent that list out to all of our board members and a few of the close advisors, and we asked them to rank how close of a relationship do they have to each individual person. And we ended up picking the one that we felt had the strongest relationship. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and if, yeah, so I think it's I think it's really really important. Yeah, ditto. I have a call with one of my CEOs in a couple of hours. We're doing just that. We're going through, they're raising around. And it's, and he wants to talk while I'm here because, uh, so we can make sure to get those introductions and mm-hmm. to folks, uh, warm intro. Don't, don't send the, the email you described. We won't mm-hmm. read it. I mean, if you are going to send an email, like three bullet points, right? Don't, don't, I get these page long emails of like, oh, this is the market. This is the, this. I mean, I can see it in the deck, right? So I don't need, you know, but I think the key highlights are, hey, we're raising, here are the terms. You know, we have two and a half million of five. You know, there's a lead investor. Are you interested in participating? I mean, like whatever the highlight is of what you're trying to get um, from that interaction. And then if the email doesn't work, you know, look at LinkedIn. Look who your mutual connections are. I mean, yeah. the med tech community is very small, mm-hmm. so you're probably one degree of separation from anyone that you want to get to. Um, and then to Iman's point, have if, if you have a relationship with that person that you're connected with, say, hey, can you introduce me to X, Y, and Z investor? Yep. So, you know, given, given the current macro, um, it, you know, challenging to raise capital, um, there are a lot of people out there that claim they can help you raise capital, right? So a lot of, you know, CEOs are approached by bankers, dealer brokers that, you know, I can help you for term retainer A and, you know, percentage B. Um, maybe for first time CEOs approached by dealer brokers and bankers, you know, what are some of the panel's thoughts on sort of how to handle that, that approach? You want to ask them to leave the room before we end? Yes. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Well, so so, so, so I, I think, I think well, I'll start. I mean, I think it comes down. So generally the way bankers get paid is they get a big chunk of the money that comes in from the investor. And investors hate that, right? Like, oh, we're paying them, what, 7% plus 7% more? And, and generally, terms on like private capital raise, private placements, it's like seven and seven. I've seen as high as 7% cash, 10% warrants. So if you're raising, I don't know, like 10 million bucks, you know, you're having you know, 700K of cash go out the window. And so investors hate that. Um, I do think having advisors around the company, like sometimes you can't get that advice from a board member because they're too busy, they're overcommitted. You know, you get them in as a big name because they have, you know, they can send the email intros, but you need that help to like refine the pitch, refine the story, make the warm introductions. I think having those advisors can be helpful Mm -hmm. um, so long as like they're real with you, right? They're not, they're not just giving you, you know, 10 minutes here, 20 minutes there, but they're going to spend time with you. They will spend hours going through your pitch deck with you. I think that's, that's helpful, especially if you're a first time CEO and you've never gotten up on stage before. I think it's helpful to have an audience that will give you candid feedback. Say, don't say that, say this, change the slides around, move, you know, the story doesn't flow this way. You know, I think if you have that kind of hands on, I think it's helpful. And bankers generally don't do that, from my experience. I mean, there's definitely a role to play. Uh, Two of my portfolio companies right now are working with bankers in different capacities. I think one thing to keep in mind is don't fall for that first date. Um, because if they come to you and they tell you they're very excited about what you joined, there's probably five or six others that are also very excited about what you're doing. And so don't fall for the first date. Find the right partner for you. It's, it's going to be somebody who you, that trusting partner, 
um, that you can be vulnerable with, that you can really work through some of these issues. And they can also play that, that role of, of an executive chair or board member to do that soft handoff. But none of that should come at a cost. Um, they should be in it for the relationship and the upfront should be next to nothing, if nothing at all, to just build the relationship. Yeah, I get very wary when there's a huge retainer right up front, plus a big percentage on the back end. Um, you see you know, a lot of activity of introductions very quickly. I, I look for, you know, are they really optimizing investor readiness before they call anyone, right? Yeah. And number two, um, once they're setting up those, those calls and those meetings, are they prepping the target on the other side? And are they prepping the CEO so that each one of those is really a curated meeting? It can't be a shotgun blast, right? Um, I, so I'm always wary when, yep, I love it. I love what you're doing. I'm going to make 200 introductions in two weeks from now, right? That huge red flag that they're not really putting in the work to get it, help you get it right. And I think there are a few more comments. I'm sorry I cut you off. I've seen a lot of stories where companies go out with a banker. They blast everybody. Everybody's heard the story. Things don't go well. Now they come back to market and it's a stale story and it didn't go well and it, they didn't deliver and all the things that were promised a year ago didn't happen. So you've, you've lost a big audience. And I think that's where, you know, the, the comment around the curated interactions is so important because you need to understand what these funds are looking for. As an example, like if you're a preclinical stage company, like you shouldn't be having conversations with Endeavor Vision and MVM because they're, you know, revenue stage investors, right? Um, and, and, you know, in the same light, you know, I think you just have to be deliberate about who you talk to and approach, and, you know, it's fine. Like, Hey, you're running your clinical study. You may be prepping for a commercial round, go talk to those folks. But if you don't even have your product developed, you're, you're never going to get traction and you're just going to be frustrated. And so I think you have to choose the conversations wisely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, agreed. Yeah, I was going to say, so, the, I mean, I think for a venture round, at least for me, just my own style is to have a direct connection with the venture group, particularly someone who's ultimately going to probably be on the board, who I see as a part of the team. So I think the, the you know, hiring someone that's in between you and them, even in that initial outset, just doesn't feel as impactful um, and I think doesn't build on the relationship the way that I, I personally would like to do it. Yeah, but you got to do what you got to do. So there's no shame. And, you know, we yeah. talk about bankers or we talk about placement agents, uh, you know, placement agents are, you know, are they're, you know, usually a step below the rung and they, you're, you're going to have a relationship with that, in, with that individual, that entity for, but they're going to have a tail when the investors they bring to you, they're going to say, Hey, if they invest again. I want an another dip on, on that. So you got to be really careful to, to what you were saying. Make sure you know who you're getting in bed with. And it is very much like dating. I'm sorry about that's a horrible reference. But um, yeah. if you're uh, out there and you're talking to people, you want to have good credibility and you want to have you want to be the person that's talking to the investors. Mm -hmm. um, but there's no there's no shame in it. Sometimes you just need to do it because you're operationally focused on something so important that you just don't have the bandwidth to go out and do it. So you find somebody that can help you make some introductions and you reward them for it because having capital is, is necessary to move the needle. Okay. Yeah. And, th so, and, that's, yeah. and, that, and that's a critical point, right? If you don't raise the money that you need to deliver at whatever terms, under whatever circumstances, with whatever partners, you don't survive as a company, right? So you have to get the capital in the door. And that, I think that's the hardest thing about being a CEO is you not only have to run the business, but you also have to make sure that the business is funded. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, about a minute left. I want to give everybody an opportunity for some quick parting shots. We're just going to run down the line. Um, Omid first, and we'll just come this way. So some quick parting shots for the audience, something they can take home. I just said mine. Ah, all right. Cool. <laughs> awesome. Anita. I, I, I think this, this panel is appropriately termed. There is light. There's a, there's a lot of deals getting done. I think we're going to see between now and the end of the year deals um, probably that exceed what's gotten done up to this point. Um, so I think just keep at it, but most importantly, use this conference as an opportunity to build those relationships. There's a lot of good people here, and uh, this is a perfect venue for it. Yeah, great. I, I would just say, yeah, just build the relationships. 
you don't know when and where they'll they'll come back um and it may not be directly with that individual or that group but they'll they, you know everyone in this community speaks to each other uh and you know i think the you know strength will build on strength and and positive uh um, reference to the company and to you and the leadership team will will, will come back in uh, in a positive way. I would just say keep pitching, pitch away, and <laughs> it, it's even if you get a no, ask for the feedback. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, you know where do we miss the mark? Uh, because that's going to make you better at at telling your story. And you know they may come around again in a year or two when 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 they're more ready for that investment. Mm-hmm. And I would say you know we talked about it earlier. People matter. You and your story matter. To me, you have about 30 seconds, and you're either going to be getting a next meeting or we're going to be done in the back of my head. Um, so, you know, I want to know that if our relationship, if we're going to invest in your company, we're going to be working together for years probably, and you're someone that we want to work with, and that you also have a relentless focus on bringing that clinical transformation, transformational technology to market, and at the same time, you have also a relentless focus on liquidity and you are focused on the same goals that your investors are focused on. So to me, people matter. Keep it quick and brief and keep it simple, the story you're telling, and have a focus on the same goal that the person you're talking to has. With that, what a great panel. I really appreciate everyone's time. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.